Because as I told you, prayer is easily caught down and taught. How do we break the yoke of disadvantage uh, from our lives? First of all, you need to know that when we talk of a yoke, I mean a disadvantage, we are talking of an unfavorable circumstance or condition that your success. It makes you not to be effective as you should be. In other words, there is a level, there is a uh, um, um, I mean some grace and there is some uh, power that God has put within you to make you effective but you are not reaching it you are not becoming that fullness that you need to become because there is something holding you from becoming that and so when we talk of a yoke of disadvantage we are talking of something that has holding you in an unfavorable circumstance or condition and has reduced your chances of success and effectiveness. Some of us, we are more than what we are today. We can do more than what we are doing today. We become more than what we have become today. But there is something, and we are trying our best actually. We are trying our best to work out of it. But there seems to be something always that rises when we are almost coming to the level that we need to enter. I know as I look at you, most of you, I, I see you have many many years to go you have quite a lot of season to venture in and that's why we want to share on this so that we break our lives in order to enter into the fullness and effectiveness that God has ordained for our lives do you believe that we we are effective than where we are today do you believe we can succeed more than where we are today I believe this evening I want you to bring it and make it as a focus that I shall not leave this place with this yoke on my life again. That I have to be effective. I have to be fully successful to the limit to the expectation of God in my life. When I talk of a yoke of I'm talking of a drawback. You want to be something. You want to reach somewhere. But there comes a drawback. It sets you behind when you are almost entering. When you want to become. When you want to go there. Something draws you back. And you become afresh again the circle repeats, repeats in your life. When I talk of a yoke of disadvantage, I'm talking of a stumbling block. There is something standing on your way. You want to become, but you cannot become because there is something standing on your way and making you not to actually become that which you desire down from the bottom of your heart. When I talk of a yoke of disadvantage, I'm talking of a hindrance. I'm talking of an obstacle that has been put on your way either by whatsoever power. It is standing on your path and you really need to become but there is something standing on your way. If you hear me, can you say amen? When I talk of a yoke of disadvantage, I'm talking of a defect, a bad feature. It's like a bad luck. You just want to become something and something happens and you miss that opportunity and you miss that place that you wanted to go. I believe this happens to many of us when we are almost planning, when we have done all that we want, when we have just come to the interview and we have all the papers and we know this thing I shall have it and somehow something happens and you go back home begin again the circle something is happening in your life that is beyond your understanding it's becoming like a fate over your life I want us to look at this evening as a moment as a season that the Lord has sent in our lives that we may break out of this yoke we may lose our lives and come out because we are more than this yoke. Somebody say amen. I want to share with you that you may know it is possible for our lives to be loosed from the yoke of disadvantage. It is possible for us to rise beyond the disadvantage of our genealogy. I want you to know that this yoke can be personal. It is hounding you as an individual so that anytime you want to become, it comes on your way and draws you back. This yoke can also be genealogical. It can be generational no, it can be ancestral. It can be something that is actually an impediment over your life but holds your genealogy. It holds your ancestors. And you can see an example in the family of our father Abraham, a father of faith. If you look at that family, you realize a few things. Number one, that the family, the genealogy of Abraham were people that loved beautiful women. They loved beautiful women. 
You know, they were people, if you want to marry, you don't just wake up and marry. You look for the one that God created at 8 o'clock in the morning when he was very fresh. <laughs> they were people who married very beautiful women. Sarah was very beautiful. That at 70 years, kings are running for her. Not chola chola boys. Kings are running for her. At 70 years, she's still shaking the world where she is. Man, they love beautiful women. Number two, the beautiful women were barren. Sarah was beautiful and barren. It took the hand of God to make her bear. And Rebecca was beautiful. You also know that Rebecca was beautiful to the level that again it forced this guy to cheat that she is not my wife. She is my sister. She was very beautiful and so this guy has to cheat. And so you see she was beautiful. Two, she was barren. It took the prayer of the man of the house to make her bear. Can you imagine a husband praying for you and you begin to bear. Can you imagine a husband releasing a miracle in your life? That is how Rebecca trusted the husband. Trusted the God of the husband. To the level that she could kneel down and say, my husband, pray for me that I get a miracle of a child. And surely the man prays and she bears. And then you'll see Another thing that flows in that line is that they were people who were held by cheating. They, they would cheat. Abraham, you know, said Sarah is my, my sister. Isaac said Rebecca is my sister. There is something flowing. I'm just trying to tell you that a disadvantage can be genealogical. It can be ancestral. It flows in your line. You find yourself in that bracket because you are a member of that bloodline. And it hounds your life. It catches up with you. But you wonder why things are happening. They are actually flowing from your genealogy and coming into your life and hounding your life. So it can be genealogical. It can follow you. That's why when it comes now to Jacob, things worsen. Because he sees the trend. He knows how his family is. And so when he comes to marry, wow, he comes to a family where there are two ladies. And when he enters that family, remember there is a history in him which is also determining what to do because your history determines your choices. And so he comes to the family and there are two ladies. One is older, another is younger. And you can guess the one that Jacob chooses. The beautiful one. <laughs> the beautiful one because that is the one they normally see at home. That is the one that looks like their family. He comes to the younger one and he chooses the beautiful one because he feels this is the one that looks like our place. But maybe God wanted to bring change. God wanted to make a different thing. But now he's bound by an ancestral flaw. He is bound by what he sees in his ancestry. And it makes him to choose the one that is beautiful. But I believe if you look at the Bible very well, God wanted to change the plan. God wanted to give him a different person. And yet he was not seeing it. And so you and me, we can see that it looks as if God is smuggling a woman into Jacob's life. Because when he prepares for receiving the woman that he has chosen that looks like their ancestry, the Bible says, he was brought another one, isn't it? You know the story. And then the next day he realizes, this is not the one that looks like our place. This is not the one that I wanted. And he realizes, I have to make some changes. I have to go back. And he went back to the father-in-law and says, you have given me a wrong person. I, did, I didn't need this. And the father-in-law says, fine, you'll have to work for another seven years. 
so that you may receive what you want. He says, I don't care. I, I must get what I want. I don't care. He says, fine. He works for seven years and when he receives the lady, she is barren. Are you getting the, the, how it flows? She is barren. She is not giving back. The history is following. The disadvantage is following. It can be genealogical. It can follow your life. Not because of you, but because of your genealogy. Your ancestry is now preceding. It's going beyond and before you to determine what is coming on your way. And so this is what we are seeing in Jacob. Even though God wants to make a change, but there is a disadvantage that is following him from the genealogy. And even to the level of making a choice of a wife. It's following him. And when now this lady is um, uh, barren, the Bible says, look at the Bible, as the story flows, I like that narrative as the story flows, you'll see the Bible says, and when God, not the devil when God saw that Leah was hated <laughs> he opened her womb now I want to ask you was she smuggled and if she was smuggled, why is God concerned? Have you ever asked yourself, if this woman was smuggled as you see, as you read, why is then God concerned again? God saw that this woman is hated. And the Bible says he opened her womb and she began to bear heavy duty children. Okay, you did not get me there. You, <laughs> you'll get me later. She begins to produce this prophetic seed. The woman that the man doesn't feel, the woman that doesn't excite the man, she is the one that producing that is producing the seed that is prophetic, and she begins to bear Reuben number one, Simeon number two, Levi number three, Judah number four. She bears children that rule the earth up to today. You can imagine they are coming from a person that when you look at the beginning, it doesn't look like it has anything. I want you to know your beginning may not determine your end. You have to look beyond the things that you begin with. Some of us begin so poorly and so badly, but just keep on. You never know what God can make out of that beginning. The Bible says, do not despise the days of your small beginnings, because the end shall come with shouts of grace. I want you to know, even as you sit under these teachings, your end shall come with shouts of grace. The Lord will make you also be favored in your end. The Bible says at that moment something happened in the life of this lady. God opened her womb even though she did not, she was not the one favored. She was not the one failed by the husband. You know, the way our generation says, Mazay, we miss him feel yenyewe. We and I miss Fayinini? Sim feel yenyewe. But you let me know feel the amebeba mbegu ya unabi. Imagine the one that doesn't excite is the one that is carrying the seed to be born that is prophetic. I don't know how you see yourself. The problem with us is that we, we have a limited view of what things happen. We have a limited, we don't see, we just see, you know, each other, but not the big scope of the purpose that God has brought into, I mean, brought us into each other. We don't see that big picture. We only see the excitement, the love, the emotions. Those are the things we see, but we don't see the big picture of the purpose. I want you to know that at this moment, we look at Rebecca, I mean, we look at Leah. The Bible says, because as I look at her and trace her, her roots, I'm trying to confirm. I'm coming to my terms to understand that God wanted to break the circle in Jacob's life. But Jacob was still being influenced by the disadvantage of the genealogy. God wants to break it, but he's not seeing it. So what happens? Because as you follow the story, you realize time comes that they have to leave and go back to their place. 
And the Bible says, as they begin the journey, everybody packs. And Jacob with his two wives, they are going back home. And the Bible says that they go on the way. Laban comes back and realizes his gods are gone. And he follows them. Hey, where are my gods? And he catches up with them. And he, he shouts and says, Jacob, how can you pay me in the way that I have sustained you? How can you do this? Jacob says, what has happened? You have taken my gods. Jacob vows and says, no way. There is none of us that can do that in the name of the God of my fathers. <laughs> he is vowing without knowing that the person who has taken Niule Menyanam fail. Yeah. He is making a vow and he doesn't know. And so what do they do? Say, let's search. And they begin to search. And of course, guess where they begin? The one that doesn't look like she is the one. And they begin to search Leah. Look at every part of her. And they give her a clean bill. A woman who got married to serve the God of the husband. A woman who got married to come as she is. But then they turn to the other lady that the man feels. And they begin to check. And says, no, 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 no. You cannot check me. I am the way of women. And the Bible says, it was not so. She had stolen and sat on them. If Jacob would have married Rachel. The plan and the prophetic word of God that was spoken in Abraham would have died. Because this woman would have made her serve the gods of where she came from at the expense of the prophetic God that he was to serve. I want to bring something to you to know that sometimes the disadvantage can be genealogical. So that you may understand the battle you are fighting may not necessarily be the way you see it. You have a limited view. That's why you are fighting with a limited scope. I want you to know. And if you follow down the story, it, be it becomes more interesting. I'm proving to you that God wanted to change. But Jacob was still under the influence of the genealogy. And so when you go down... The Bible says on the way, of course, God remembers Rachel and she gets pregnant, she bears. And uh, when she's bearing the second child, the Bible says she dies during uh, childbirth. And when she dies, they carry her right on the way. They carry her and they bring her. I mean, they dig her a grave just on the road. And they bury her there. And the journey continues. But when Leah dies, they carry her to the graves of the fathers and they bury her next to Sarah. To the level that at the end, when Jacob is almost dying, what does he testify? My sons, when I die, take me and bury me in the graves of my fathers next to Leah. <laughs> he gets a revelation. When Things have gone so far. Some of us, we don't know the value of the people we have. We don't know and we still imagine. I always tell my, my village church. But when God has given you somebody, you take them for granted. Because of the way you came into each other's lives. Because of the way you began your life. There are some people who married because they impregnated each, each other. <laughs> So you feel like whatsoever way that you came into each other, you must understand it has a higher plan than the way it happened. There is something more and you better embrace what God has given you. You better believe in it. You better have it because you don't understand. You may be suffering from a genealogical disadvantage. It makes you not to be satisfied with what God has given you. It makes you to feel this is not the person. I want to end up that area before we move to the next one by asking a very genuine question. Somebody say amen. By the way, are you saved? Delivered? 
Because you are sitting in deliverance. You are delivered, obvious. Now, if you are delivered, I want you to be sincere. Maybe I don't know whom I can ask. Now, this is not witch hunting place. This is just learning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> this is not witch hunting. This is learning. Um, pastor Kidera, I know he's a pastor and the wife cannot beat him at home. Because uh, I know they love one another. Pastor, I want, I want us to teach these people. Uh, before God and before the angels and before this congregation. <laughs> Pastor, tell us, is this woman seated next to you the one that really excited you from your, ch you know, you are. <laughs> Come on, why are you laughing? <laughs> This man, I'm going to take him through deliverance. <laughs> I want to bring to your attention to know this. That many times the partners we live with are not the ones who really excited us. That's the truth. Many times the person you end up marrying is not the one that used to make the spirits of your ancestors rise. So because of that, you can be tempted to think you made a wrong choice. You can be tempted to think you are still on the run looking for the right person. Just because of how you came into each other's life. Just because of, you know, because many times the people we marry, me, my wife, I, we were like, are we marrying or we are joking and we are married? <laughs> we are married. And somehow by the time I'm thinking like it's, we have already a child. And somehow we have two. Oh my God. So we are here. <laughs> but listen, as time has gone by, I've come to realize she was the best than those that were exciting me. She has become the best instrument that God ever brought in my life. But in the beginning, it was not like that. Man, if there is somebody that excites you until the spirits of your ancestors rise, check, she may be having some gods. <laughs> check. I always tell my village church, kama mtu anakufanya hivyo, anakukalia chapati. Shauri yako. Because many times, our wives don't look, you know, such a, eh? no, but they are people that God has sent. And so you have to learn how to embrace. Your husband doesn't look, you know, like those ones you are seeing through the window outside there. But anyway, he is the one that God has sent because he knows what you need. God does not give us what we want. He gives us what we need. It's good for you to mature enough. And embrace the will of God for your life. If you are hearing me, can we say amen like we mean it? Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. So a disadvantage can be genealogical. It can also be regional. A disadvantage can also be regional. Holding a whole entire place. Making the people in that place all lie under that disadvantage. It can be regional. It can make, it can hound the people of a given region into a certain trend, into a certain happening, into a certain bondage and slavery and captivity because it is actually holding the entire region. It can be regional. It can hold a place. When you come to Busia, I was sharing with one family that had traveled from one of the places in Kenya where people care for their families and they, they had stayed there for seven years and their life was very good and they loved each other when they were there. Things were very nice and they enjoyed life but then they were transferred to Busia uh, uh, as to work there. And they came as a family with the same love and year one, year two, year three that love was no longer there. Something began to happen because in Busia, the spirit of immorality rules. When you enter there, that spirit baptizes you on the gate. And then it brings you to 
options of some good Ugandan ladies who kneel when they address you. And these many Kenyans have never seen such a miracle in their lives. <laughs> and so what happens? The guy imagines so somebody can serve me water on the knees. And they get confused. And they get off from their truck. I've handled that many times for those who come there. Because they don't understand that a disadvantage can be regional. They were living well for seven years. What has happened? The place they have entered has some influence, has some impact on their lives. That's why you must understand some of the battles you're fighting may not be about you too. Others you'll kill each other. They may not be about you. They may be about your region. They may be about your place. I, I mean, we are sharing this because I want to open your scope of fighting the battle. Because some of us, if you don't know how to know how you're fighting, you may never fight this battle to the best. I just want to open your mind to know that we fight more than what we are seeing. There is more than what we are seeing. Somebody can you say amen. A disadvantage can be uh, regional. It can hold a place and bring it into captivity. If you hear me, can you say amen? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to submit to you to know that this disadvantage has many, the yoke of disadvantage has many things it can do in your life. When this yoke is operational in your life, number one, it keeps you bound in a state of emotional, spiritual, and financial poverty. It binds you. It binds your life. It makes you never to enjoy what you need to enjoy. You see, but you cannot enter. You see it, but you cannot access. It holds you. It puts you with a syndrome of near to success. You are almost there, but yet you are not entering. That's what this yoke does. It can hold your life and keep you bound in a state. And that's why this evening, when we pray, we must lose ourselves. There is a level we can access. There is a level we can manifest. There is a level we can arrive. I believe all of us, this yoke of disadvantage must be broken in our lives. Because there is somewhere God is waiting for us. There is somewhere the nations are waiting for us. There is somewhere the people are waiting for us. Our life is meant to shine somewhere. But we are disadvantaged. That's why this evening, in this meeting, in this prayer session of 2018, somebody you must live here knowing that that yoke of disadvantage has been broken from my life. Make this prayer to be that prayer. So that when you live here, you cannot again be holden again in that state. I believe with all my heart, and that is what I desire. Real men, I have not just come to teach, I've also come to receive this. I am a member of this place. I've come to partake of what God is doing here. Don't think I'm just speaking to you. I desire to break out of this. I desire to reach somewhere. I want to be somewhere, just like everybody wants to be somewhere. Somebody say amen. A disadvantage must be actually uh, something that you must handle. And look, it, uh, uh, we have said number one, it binds you. It keeps you bound in a state of emotional, in a state of spiritual, in a state of financial poverty and incapacitation. You cannot move forward. It ensures that you don't experience a breakthrough and that you are tied uh, at, at the same place without growth. You are not moving. You are not, you know, stretching. You need to move, but you are not moving. Because there is a yoke of disadvantage holding your life. A yoke of disadvantage, number two, it, what does it do in your life? It destroys your hope and your faith uh, and the future of your life because it has been placed on your life. It destroys the hope. It destroys the faith. It destroys the future that you have because it has been placed over your life. When a disadvantage is operation in your life, it makes your life um, to be bound to circumstances. You know, you lose the hope and you make your life to succumb to things that you should not succumb to. You know, you reach a place and you agree with your circumstances. You agree and you feel like this is who I am. It looks like this is how our people are. It looks like this is how our genealogy is. It looks like because I've seen it in my brothers. I've seen it in my people. It looks like that is how we are. Listen to me. It makes people not to understand just the way even 
Isaac blessed Jacob. And then after that, Esau appears. And Esau had been disadvantaged. And we shall be looking at that. Somebody say amen. When you look at that life of Esau, he is disadvantaged. This man is disadvantaged right from the womb. Right from the womb. When the children are fighting in the womb, the mother goes to pray. And asks God, what is happening? And God tells him, there are two nations inside you. But the older shall serve the younger. They are not yet born. They have not sinned. They have not done anything. But there is a disadvantage already spoken even before he comes out. I want you to look at this situation. This man is suffering from a disadvantage. And if you look at the life of this man, it, you know, many people that are disadvantaged, they, they can easily, you know, come to a state of succumbing to what the disadvantage is, to what the circumstance is. You know, that, that disadvantage of that yoke makes you to feel this is the far we can go in life and we can never go beyond this. Because a yoke makes you to be a slave over a place. It binds your life. And that's how many people are. They feel like this is how we are. This is how we look like. This is how our people are. And so they have taken the state of that situation. They have allowed it to brand their lives. They are now branded by that situation. But I want you to know we are more than that. Can somebody say amen? amen. If you hear me, can you say amen, brothers? Hallelujah. The disadvantage has holden this man and he has, it has made him to, you know, agree with the circumstances. And yet, you know, the father told him, although that I have blessed your younger brother, but there is something I'm telling you. If you grow restless, the day you grow tired, the day you say enough, is enough. Isn't that what the, the father told him? Yes, I've blessed your father, but there is something I'm telling you. The day you grow restless, it means I can fight my way out of disadvantage. It means I should not just settle there and say, after all, that is how we are. I should not just agree with the situation. I must say no, even though this has happened, but I can make it in life. And that's why even though Esa was cast, that man was rich. Uh, even though that man was not blessed, he still made it in life. That man understood the statement of the father. And the statement said, the day you grow restless, the day you get tired, you will break the yoke of disadvantage. You'll break it out of your life. It means I can stand and say, hey, hey, you yoke. Here, I have carried you enough. You have tormented my family enough. You have made us to suffer enough. But from today, we must sort out issues. We must come to the table. I bring you to the courtroom of God. We must listen today. You must know that I am meant to succeed. I am meant to go far. I am meant to make it. I am meant to be the head and never the tail. I am meant, are you hearing me? I want you to understand, you can break out of disadvantage. You should not rest and imagine that is who you are. Many people have succumbed to what disadvantage has told them. That yoke of disadvantage has holden many people. Number three, what does this yoke of disadvantage, disadvantage do to your life? It has the power to place your future in the hands of the enemy. It has the power to place your future. In the hands of the enemy. When you are under disadvantage. You can place your future. You can bring your life. The yoke can bring your life and tie it to the hands of the enemy. In a manner that the enemy now begins to drive your future. 
The enemy begins to drive where you are going. He begins to determine what will happen to you. Uh -uh, this is not what should happen to us. We cannot allow our hands to be trusted to the enemy because of the disadvantage of our family. Because when it is in our family, it means you are predetermined. You are walking in that disadvantage. You are walking in what has been predetermined. We cannot allow this to happen to us. We are more than our families. We are individuals but are higher I want you to know the Lord has made your life to be higher than what people say. Come on, if you believe it, can you shout like you mean it? Amen. Amen. You are more than what people say. You are more than what your parents say. You are more than where people placed you. And you begin to believe it. Begin to live it. Begin to talk it. Begin to walk it. You will see it be revealed in your life. A disadvantage will hold and set your life into the hands of the enemy as you walk in. And that's what we see when it is already put within your life. Lastly, a disadvantage uh, tells you what to do and it holds you along the way. It places you in the hands of people that are already bound. When you are disadvantaged, the Bible says the deep calls unto the deep. When you are disadvantaged, you'll find yourself always walking among the people that are also disadvantaged. A disadvantage can determine even your association. No wonder my friend Jephthah, when he was chased from home and thrown out, the Bible records he went to a place where he found fellow Baradulis like him. He began to walk among them. When you are disadvantaged, you also look for people that talk your language. You walk among them. You bring yourself under such a place. You cannot walk with people that can challenge you. Because to you, the challenge is in limitation. The challenge is, you know, this one, energy do. Huh? This one, sir, they have put themselves in class. Because now you are disadvantaged. And so the disadvantage begins to rearrange your mentality. Rearrange your thinking. And you begin to think like your fellows. You begin to think and you always want to be drawn closer to the people that look like you. I want you to know that God has made you so special. Can somebody say amen? And I want you to know, Esau gives us the best example of people that are disadvantaged. He gives us the best example. He's a man that is disadvantaged. Life does not go the way he expected. He is the firstborn of the family. And so he's expected to get the blessing of the firstborn. He is to be the authority of the family. As the firstborn according to the Jewish custom. But life does not go like that. He represents a people that have wrong footings in life. They wanted to become something. But something has happened. And they don't understand how to go about it. This man, Mr. Esa, he is a man and he represents some of us. Whose brothers and sisters seem to be doing very well. But we are not doing well like them. You know, they are shining. Jacob, everybody's shining. But this man is struggling. Everything he does does not work. He works harder. But he doesn't receive the results. Because he went to look for some meat in the bush. He was such a tough man to hunt. He was, to, he was a, a robust man. He's doing the best. But look at this man. When he arrives, the thing is gone. He has worked hard. But when he just wants to receive, the thing is gone. He is a representation of a people that are working hard. They are trying their best. But life is not going equivalent to their effort. It's not moving to the level of what they are putting in. And I know many times we find ourselves in such a state. We find ourselves in such a situation. We have worked hard. We have done all things. We have just come. And when we just reach almost the place, the thing is gone. Esau is a representation of some people in this house, including me. People that feel the brothers have a voice over them. The sisters have a voice over them. When they say people hear, but when they say nobody hears. When they say, when they talk a point, people, you know, clap. But when they say a point, nobody even nods. 
This is a picture of a, a person that is bound by a disadvantage. He is by you know the physique the best. Hard working. But life is not going the way he is doing it. And I know this is how some of us are. And that is the thing that I want to present to your table that you may know. Because there are people that have deprived. Esau represents people that have been deprived their portion that belongs to them. Not because of anything, but they have been deprived. They feel people have taken what belongs to me. Somebody has taken it. Somebody has just worked on and taken what should, should be mine. Those are the people we are looking at and talking about disadvantage. If you hear me, can you say amen? I know Esa wanted some life to be imparted to him. He wanted a certain life, a certain glory to be imparted to his life. And he knew the right person to do it was the father. The father to the Jewish customs carried your pace and platform for your next glory. The father laid it. You could stand on it and go far. And so Esau understood that this father is the one to lay this kind. And so he came to the father and he began to cry. And he said, please, can you bless me? And the father said, I've already blessed your brother. I have even made him to be Lord over you. I've said all others shall serve him. And the guy cried and said, please, is there even just one blessing that has remained? Please bless me. Please, my father. He said, please, I have blessed this guy. But anyway, anyway, although I have blessed him, anyway, if you grow restless, as much as I blessed him, but if you grow restless, you will break the yoke of your brother's influence from your shoulders. In other words, I've loved Jesus because Jesus will never leave you with nothing. <laughs> he will never leave you with nothing. He will never leave in the world that you don't know how to begin. He will at least leave you with something. Even though the one you wanted has been taken. But Jesus will leave you something that shall still walk you to that place. He will give you something that you can hold on however weak it is. But it can take you to the place of influence. You are not as bad as left with nothing. There is something in your life. If you hear me, can you say amen? Jesus will never leave you with nothing. You may not have been given what the other one has. You may have not been given beauty, but you have been given some brain. You may not have been given some brain, but you have some beauty. There is a swag on your life. Ah... Uh, Somebody, can you say amen? amen? You should not break. There is something about your life that even though you feel disadvantaged, you can engage. You can utilize. That's why you must be careful of what God has given you. However small it is, it can bring about a revolution in your life. It can bring about a transformation in your life. Moses had just a stuff in his hands. And that stuff delivered Israel. The woman, you know, you remember the widow, okay? She had only a vial of oil, but did that make the miracle? You may have something too little that you wonder if it can work. My word to you is it will work. God has proved it that it can work. If you can trust it and work on it and begin somewhere with it, it can take you out of that place. Where people have left you, you can still overtake them. Ah, after this meeting, there shall be an overtaking grace. Somebody shall overtake those that have gone before him. Somebody shall go before you shall. Ah, I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. If you hear me, can you say yes? You can overtake. You can do it. Because God has designed your life to go somewhere. I want to talk to some mess in this house. I know you are wondering how you can break the disadvantage. Grow restless. 
this evening grow restless and let that restlessness take you to prayer let it take you to the place of prayer because it is the place of prayer that will break the disadvantage Isaiah 58 verse number 6 is a scripture that many of us I know we use when we go to pray uh, it says that this is the kind of fast that the Lord has chosen that we may break the yoke in other words, the yoke can be broken in prayer and fasting. Fasting is the power, is the tool that God has given us to break the yoke. Can somebody say amen? Let's, let's all read together. Let's go together. Is not this the fasting I have chosen? I have what to do? To lose the chains of injustice. And number two, to untie the cords of the yoke. Number three, to set the oppressed free. Number four, to pray. In other words, when we choose to fast, we are handling another level of issues. And one way we can handle this thing called the yoke is when we engage fasting. Fasting is another level of dealing with issues. You are not just praying. And I'm not talking about hungering. I'm not talking about you know, denying yourself food. It is different from fasting. Fasting is deliberate. You have it but you have decided. There is a more important issue. That I need to handle about my life. I want to place myself in the hands of God. Who said that when we fast. He breaks yokes. Somebody, are you getting my friends? I want you to take that chance and know that one way we can deal with the yoke of disadvantage is by prayer and fasting. When we fast, no wonder Jesus taught the disciples one time and he told them when, when you know, he, he came down and he found these guys had fought with a demon, fought with a demon and, uh, and um, uh, the demon had not left. And so, uh, when he, he came with such authority, he commanded the demon and the demon left. And so the guy squeezed him in a corner and asked him, Jesus, why could we not chase that demon? What happened? And Jesus said, such a one. Such a one. Eh? It means there is a, another kind. It means they are not the same. Say, such a one cannot go except by prayer. And fasting. It means you can see the tool of prayer. So important if you want to access certain levels in life. If you have never known the place of prayer and fasting, then you will never enjoy certain glories in your life. Because to certain glories, the key that opens there is prayer and fasting. So you must know the power of engaging in prayer and fasting. And that's why I want to make a request. Tomorrow, can we pray and fast? See, this is a prayer and fasting meeting. Tomorrow, can we pray and fast? I want to ask that when you come in the evening, because purely we dedicate tomorrow to be a day of prayer and fasting. And we want to handle issues. We want to deal with matters. But at the end of that session, somebody, the yoke of disadvantage shall not hold your life again. I know it shall come to pass. Can somebody say amen? The second way we handle the yoke of disadvantage is by priestly and prophetic declaration. When a priest and a prophet declares in your life, when a priest and a prophet speaks in your life, they are able, they have an anointing they have a grace. Their authority is given to them to break yokes of disadvantage in people's lives. That's why when you look at Genesis 49, in the times that Jacob is blessing the children, and he speaks in Reuben, you know the story. And he speaks in Reuben, and he says, Reuben, although you are my firstborn, you know, the, 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 the strength of my manhood, you know, and then he turns and he says, but because you are unstable as waters, you will not excel. And so he puts a disadvantage on the sun. 
That meant that Reuben, it didn't matter how hard he worked. There was a disadvantage placed on him by an authority. And so he lived struggling, almost being extinguished in Israel until Moses came to his life. Ah, uh, if you hear me, can you say amen? That shows the importance of a pastor in your life. That shows the voice of a prophet in your house. That shows the importance of the voice of a father in the spirit. When you have that voice, and I want you to ask your neighbor, please ask your neighbor, do you have a prophetic voice in your family? I mean, do, do they have, surely? Because you need to have one. They have a place. They have a, a very vital part in your life. You must have it. And some of you have it just because somebody preaches to you on Sunday. And you feel like that is my prophetic voice. A prophetic voice must not just be, you know, the one that speaks to you on Sunday on an altar as you are sitting there. A prophetic voice is a person you interact with. You come down. You invite in your house. And you tell them, Daddy, this time I don't want you to come and chase demons in my house. I don't have one. Come and you eat. And they come. I've, I've seen this many times to my children in Busia. And they, they just say, Daddy, today, I don't want have, I don't, and even if I have, this time is not for chasing demons. Come, sit, eat, and talk to us. And I got to sit. And they, they, they bring plates and plates and cups and cups and, you know, things that are blue and green and all those. And after we finish, I stand up and I bless that family. And it has never remained the same. Never. All those families that have acknowledged. Because you know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 from verse number 40, 41, whomsoever receives a prophet eh, as a prophet. Do you remember that? Whomsoever receives a prophet, what? As a prophet. Will do what? Receive the reward of a prophet. What that person carries is only released when that person is received. And one way you receive that person is create space for them in your life. Create space for them in your house. Make them come and sit with you. Create a way to lay a demand on the grace on them. Because if that grace is not laid a demand, it will never work for you. You must learn and create a forum to lay a demand on the grace. And that's what I did. That's what we do. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to challenge you. That you may know God has given us vessels that can break us out of disadvantage. And these are the prophetic and priestly voices that are always with us. They are always, we see them, but we don't know the potential they carry. They have a lot that they can break in our lives. Somebody, can you say amen? I want you to know that, that you have can be able to break that which is in your life. That's why in Deuteronomy chapter number 33, when you begin from verse number 6, you will see when Moses is almost to go the way of the earth, he calls all Israel tribe by tribe. And he says, I want to speak in your life because I've led you for quite long. I have to define your life and redefine some of you. Listen to me. A prophetic voice can redefine your life. It can redefine what people have done to you. It can redefine what your genealogy has limited you. It can redefine you to bring you to another new level. And that's why you must know that God has given you a prophetic voice in the house. Can somebody say amen? So you must engage. You must have a way. Uh, if you are not understanding me, you may look at the life of Hannah. Hannah went to Shiloh for many years. Many years. She went to Shiloh, always in that pain with the mockery of Benina. She went to Shiloh for many years until one day she made up her mind. And she said, this time, I will not need an altar call. I will not need anything. I will go to that house and get what I want. 
And she came to the altar without an altar call. And she began to call unto the Lord. And the Bible says, and so she found favor in the man of the house. You can be in the house and if you have never interacted with the man of the house, you may never get to be released into what you want. She had been in that house many times, but she had never interacted with the man of the house. Until Eli came to her and Eli spoke to her and she understood if I have gotten the grace, the favor to be and to be addressed by the man of the house, this is my time. And she prepared and you'll see the way she answers. And you know, Eli came a bit tough. She said, you woman at nine o'clock, you have come here already drunk. If it was some of you here. I'm saying the truth. It was, it was some of you. You have come in the church with problems. And you are crying your problems on the altar. And then a pastor comes. And says, gentlemen. At this time. You are already drunk. What do you think you could have done? Mungu. At a pastor angali anona nimelewa. Ah, mungu. You would have done some drama in that place. That pain would have been released in a funny way. But this woman understood I have gotten a chance with the authority of the house. Because when I handle this authority well, my disadvantage will be gone. And so what does she do? She handles with care and she answers with humility. And she says, no, please, servant of God. I am not, your servant is not, your maid servant is not drunk. But she's pouring her heart to the Lord. And then what did Eli do? Did he speak much? He said, let it be. May the Lord do to you as your heart desires. And she said, please may your servant find favor. She, she's submitting to those. She knows that the words of the priest, the words of the prophet, when they are released in my life, my disadvantage is gone. And she left there like she knows God has spoken to me. I'm sure when she left there, she went to buy some maternity dress. <laughs> she began to walk the word. She began to walk the direction. She began to walk what the man of God had said. She began to practice it. And surely, she came to realization. Ladies and gentlemen, how do we relate with the men of the house? How do we relate with them? They may be simple, but God has vested your destiny's release into their declaration. Learn how to relate. Learn how to share with them. Learn how to be able to create some forum for them. I'll never forget one time I prepared myself very well in the morning and I told my wife, um, tomorrow, I'm going on, on duty tomorrow. When I come, I will be visiting my members and seeing how they are looking like in their houses. And my wife says, fine, that's good, daddy. And so I thought I've communicated well. And she said, that's good. And so in the morning, I prepared, I put on very well as, you know, somebody going to visit my, my members. And then as I was preparing as just to leave, I went to the sitting room, and that day it was not the way I, I normally see it when I leave. And I wondered what has happened today in the house. And so she took my hand and brought me to the table. And she said, Daddy, and you know, even I was confused because the table had some eggs, some what, the things I don't normally take when I leave. So she, I found things have changed. And she said, Daddy, Today you are not my husband. Today you are the priest and prophet of this house. Hi, I was touched. I, you know, I began to make fun. I laughed. She said, I am serious. <laughs> so I also turned to be serious. <laughs> yes. So I ate like a prophet in my house. And then after I had eaten, she said, what you could do and what you are going to do to the member's house do it to my house. And so I told her, kneel down. And she knelt down. My friends, I have never prayed for my family like that day. 
I have never. I have never prophesied carelessly. <laughs> it was powerful. We ended up praying for one hour and 14 minutes. We prayed. I prophesied to each and every child of that woman. 